So, our scripture tonight comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 39. We're reading from the Common English Bible. The original title. Really? Okay. So, still? Now it likes to be held. We found that out last week. It likes to be held. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the original title of tonight's sermon was going to be Body, Mind, and Spirit. And then sometimes the sermon gets its own ideas and it kind of switches around. But the reason it was going to be called Body, Mind, and Spirit is because this scripture deals with the health and the healing of body, mind, and spirit. In this scripture, we experience Jesus healing diseases, illnesses, and injuries of the body. And we experience Jesus healing diseases, illness, and illnesses, and injuries of the mind, which is one way of understanding <coughs> demon possession in scripture. Not the only way, but one way of looking at it. If you think about pre-scientific age and... Um, what conditions that we refer to now, like chronic depression, bipolar, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, I mean, you know those things happened then too. They didn't have names. And someone, for instance, with schizophrenia, it's not unusual for them to hear voices, for them to be led by voices in their mind. And back then, to see somebody like that would make that person appear to be what? Out of their mind. And if you're out, if you're out of your mind, who's in there running the show? Well, the thought was maybe demons. And I, and I feel like I need to mention that even in 2015, unfortunately, there is a real stigma that goes along with mental illness as if it is not a medical issue of the mind and it remains a bit of a taboo subject, and it shouldn't. But you can see, you know, how, how even stronger it would have been at that time. So we see Jesus healing people physically, mentally, emotionally, and then we see Jesus very purposefully attending to the health of his own spirit. And this is where the sermon is heading this evening. It's this part, this profound example that Jesus sets for all of us. And apparently, the healing of his own spirit is as important to the writer of this gospel as the medical miracles of healing physically and healing mentally. So, out of respect for the gospel, please stand for the reading of the scripture. After leaving the synagogue, Jesus, James, and John went home with Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed, sick with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. He went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she served them. That evening, at sunset, people brought Jesus those who were sick or demon-possessed. The whole town gathered near the door. He healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases. He threw out many demons, but he didn't let the demons speak because they recognized him. Early in the morning, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. Simon and those with him tracked him down. When they found him, they told him, everyone's looking for you. He replied, let's head in the other direction to the nearby villages so that I can preach there too. That's why I have come. He traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and throwing out demons. The word of God for the people of God. So I have a question for you. Right now at this time in your life, how many people depend on you? Right now in this time in your life, how many people depend on you? And you might be wondering, well, what exactly do you mean by depend on me? Well, let's start with the basics. Food, drink, shelter, clothing. Start with that, OK? A sense of safety and security, okay? Who depends on you as family? Who depends on you as friend? Who depends on you for love and compassion? At this point in your life, how many people depend on you? Obviously, this varies a great deal, depending on the age and stage of life that we are in. 
but it includes family and friends and coworkers. It includes neighbors. It includes anybody we're involved in, uh, an extracurricular activity, a ministry, a committee, whether we're leading it or, or one of the team. We depend on each other for a number of things. And sometimes, depending on the time in your life, the level of others' dependence on you can be intense and constant. When my kids were really young, I went from working full-time to working half-time, and I opened my own business. It was a communications and design business. I kept that to 20 hours a week so I could spend the balance of that time with my kids. I wanted to spend as much time with them, my kids as I could, and I still needed to bring in some income. So the time I spent with my kids, I was really spending with my kids. And they were young, and, and even for just a moment, I would go to say, use the bathroom. The only place a mom can legitimately lock the door. <laughs> Within moments, there'd be a little hand knocking on the outside. Mom, mom, where, what are you doing, mom? What, Aaron needs you, I need you, the cat needs you, somebody needs you, you know? It's like, just give me a moment, please. And it's this feeling like, what? Everyone's looking for you. Everyone needs you. And I love my kid, and that was fine, but it's like, wow, give me a minute, give me a minute. So then the, the, the balance of that was that I was spending time working. And very often I was, I was overseeing projects, but, and it's like this in, in many professions I know, uh, but certainly within communications, you, you just, you live for deadlines. Deadlines, deadlines, deadlines. And, and you become convinced that if you miss one, the world will end, <laughs> definitely. And so when we would come to crunch time on something like, it's just about time to make a presentation for a fairly big project, or everything's getting ready to go to the printer, and I'm dealing with writers and designers, and I'm dealing with a client and sometimes a printer, and at those moments, you know how that, everything at once. Everybody has questions at the same time, legitimately, at the same time. Everybody's looking for you. Everybody needs you. And I thoroughly enjoyed that job. I thoroughly enjoyed that kind of work. But those times come when everyone is looking for you. And I don't have any doubt that you all have experienced this. You all know what this feels like. And you may even be in a place in your life right now where you're sandwiched. You're in that generation where you are raising fairly young children that still really need your time and attention. And you may have aging parents who really are legitimately at a place where they need your time and attention. And you love your kids, and you love your parents. But wow, talk about everybody's looking for you. Talk about everybody needs you. And I'll tell you what, as clergy, I feel like this sometimes. Manchester's a big church. There's, no there's nothing I would rather be doing and no place I would rather be. But I'll tell you what, things come in bunches. They do. There's a lot of need in a church this size, and that's what clergy are there for. But I mean, sometimes the pager goes off two or three times over the weekend, and it's pretty serious stuff on top of everything else. And there is this sense of everybody's looking for you. Everybody needs you. Now, I love my vocation, and I love my kids, and I love my parents, and I love all of you, but I've made a decision. The first week in March, Monday through Friday, I'm running away. <laughs> I am going to go with seven other people, four men, four women from our district, and we are going to the Abbey of Gethsemane in New Haven, Kentucky. It's a fully functioning Trappist monastery, and it was the spiritual home of Thomas Merton when he was living. I think that name is probably familiar to a number of you. It was founded in 1848, and ever since the day they opened the door, they have been welcoming guests. I am going for a retreat. And a fundamental part of retreats at this abbey is silence. Silence. So I am going for a silent retreat. Silence is absolutely necessary to set an atmosphere conducive to prayer. Absolutely and without question. And this Abbey's retreats are not only silent, but they're unstructured and undirected. You can make an appointment and sit down and talk to a monk, but that's about it. 
There's two specific areas where you're allowed to talk out loud, and that's it. The rest of the time is silent. I'll be arriving there with seven other people, but once we get there, I will be on my own. There's times of prayer with the monks where we gather. There's times where we will eat together, and still, it will be silent. There will be no talking. There's no scheduled group time. The eight of us have decided we're not going to start unpacking the experience in one of those two designated areas where you can talk. We're not going to do it. We're going to wait until we're on the, in the cars driving home before we talk about it. Part of the retreat has to do this praying of the hours with the monks. It's nine different times of praying, and it starts at 3.15 in the morning. And then at 5.45 and 6.15 and 7.30 in the morning, and then you move into early afternoon, and final, the ninth time of prayer happens at 7.30 in the evening. So I'm wondering, what do you think about that? <laughs> See, I imagine for some of you, this sounds absolutely intriguing. I think for some of you, this probably sounds inspiring. It sounds renewing. It sounds so much better than locking yourself in the bathroom. <laughs> And I would imagine for some of you, it sounds like nothing more than cruel and unusual punishment. And I'll tell you what, as much as I am looking forward to this retreat, and I absolutely am, I do realize that it is going to be a challenge. There's no doubt. Because what I have come to recognize in myself is that I am out of practice with the spiritual practice of silence. Years ago, I spent a great deal of time in the morning in prayer and then in silence. And as time went by and I got busy with things, that time of silence started to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink to the point where this is like confession. I actually, thinking, when I'm thinking about it, I spend very little time in silence. And when I do, it's just things rattling around in my head. So, I don't think it's going to be a challenge for me to be silent. What will be challenging is what comes up during that silence. So will this be an experience of peace? I'd like to think so. But I think it's probably going to be a real amplification of the stuff in my head. Things that I've been too busy to deal with on a daily basis. And you know, either way, I absolutely welcome the experience because I'm in a place where I need it. Either way, I need to walk through it, whatever it brings. And any pain, discomfort, frustration, or anxiety, I welcome it. I welcome it because that's part of the spiritual healing process. And this, I want this to be a launch again of silent time for me in the morning with my prayer time. And if we look at our scripture, we know that Jesus and James and John went home with Simon and Andrew and Simon's mother-in-law was very ill. So Jesus did a miracle healing. Um, he just, he touched her, she was fine, she started serving. You know what I always just am amazed by? You know, this day and age, we have miracle surgeries without a doubt. Things that couldn't have been done 10 years ago. People will have incredible mir miracle surgeries. They still need physical therapy when they're done. When Jesus heals somebody, they don't even need physical therapy. You know, she hopped right up and I think probably started making a meal for these guys. That's really incredible. And that evening at sunset, people brought to Jesus those who were sick and demon-possessed. Brought lots of people to the door of that house. And Jesus healed many, many people that night. And then we assume that Jesus went to sleep, that everybody went to sleep. Some people went home, that it got quiet. Because the next thing we read is, early in the morning, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. And what happens? Simon and those with him tracked him down. And when they found him, they told him, everyone's looking for you. And he replies, let's head in the other direction. They're saying, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. He said, no, we're going to head in the other direction so that I can preach there too. That's why I've come. See, Jesus knew what his priorities were. He didn't even hesitate. Well, maybe we could 
deal with a few people back there and then go. No, he knew exactly what he was supposed to do. And I think Jesus is setting a pretty clear example for us as well. As I was doing research for this sermon and on this scripture, I found um, something written by an Episcopal priest. His name is uh, Reverend Rick Morley. And I kept going back to it, specifically on this scripture, and I kept going back to it because it just made so much sense to me. And I could have tried to reword it or give you a sense of it, but he does this so well. I just want to share it with you the way he wrote it. He has two points. The first is this. As vitally important to the salvation of the world that Jesus' earthly ministry was, it was not so important that Jesus didn't have time to take care of himself and his spiritual connection with his heavenly father. And if Jesus can find the time to care for his spiritual nurture, how much more can we find the time? I mean, I have an important job and all, but I'm not the savior of the world. And even the savior of the world needs quiet time alone with God. See, even as Jesus miraculously healed those other people like this, when it came to his own spiritual health, it didn't go like this. It took quiet time alone with God. See, I think that's fascinating. The spiritual health requires quiet time alone with God, even for Jesus. And so I look at that and I think, why would we, why would I try and circumvent something that even Jesus couldn't do without? It doesn't make any sense. And the second point that Reverend Morley makes is this. Jesus demonstrates that you don't have to do it all. You can't save everyone. Sometimes you have to move on. Sometimes you just have to pick up and go where the Spirit sends you, even if it means people are still going to be in need. Because honestly, there are always going to be people in need. This is an example of Jesus showing how to set boundaries, knowing when to say no. And if you know your priorities, you're able to do that. Reverend Morley finishes up with this. It is disorienting because it's a totally different way of thinking about existence, career, and ministry. It demonstrates so clearly that the world doesn't revolve around me or you. We are more than the tasks we accomplish. We are. We are so much more than the tasks we accomplish, and yet, at the same time, the tasks are important. At Manchester United Methodist Church, we strive to make a difference for Christ in the world, and we don't do that by sitting around. Jesus knew what his priorities were. How? Well, he checked in with God every day. He had quiet time alone with God every single morning. And so he knew what God's priorities for him were, without question. And so I think to myself, I have priorities. How did I decide? You have priorities. How did you decide?